What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another session of Real Talk Tuesday. Um, glad that you are here. Glad that you came to hang out and and study and and think and talk and learn and grow. And so, um, let's let's get right to it. We spent two, the last couple weeks talking about um, about uh, Jacob and uh, per your request. You, some of you said that you wanted to do a deep dive and I had every intention of kind of moving around and pulling some principles and some some stories but you said you wanted to do a deep dive so here it is and this is our third week of talking about the life of Jacob I, I when I think about patterns of brokenness and uh, toxic patterns that the first uh, character first figure, first character that comes to mind is that of, of Jacob and, and Jacob's life has this, you know, um, powerful, profound story of these, these patterns of brokenness, you know, people, sometimes people refer to as generational curses, right? And so, um, and we can see in Jacob's family, how Jacob was, we talked about nurture, right? And Jacob was kind of uh, uh, molded um, in 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 deception, right? That he learned how to deceive from his from his mom, and then he was he was also um, he, he was also believed to be a deceiver by nature, right? That from birth he was grabbing his brother's heel, and so we we talked about that, and then, and then we talked about how how God works to kind of reorient us or reteach us or renew us uh, to break those cycles of of brokenness and of toxicity and so we talked about um, how how struggle and suffering hardship um, works to reorient us and 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 also the supernatural so struggle in the supernatural that sometimes it's just God's direct work in our lives right and so I want us to go a little bit further. We're, we're talking about Joseph. But before we go, uh, we're talking about Jacob, but now we find ourselves in in um, discussing his his son Joseph. And so before we go any further, let's let's pray. God, thank you for your goodness and your grace. Thank you for uh, your word. We pray that this time would be. Uh, fruitful and beneficial to us uh, as we study, help us to learn and grow that we might change. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's go to um, Genesis chapter 37. And um, this is important because uh, when we talk about, um, when, we, when we talk about uh, patterns toxic patterns um they have a a an uncanny way of sticking around right and i like to think about this this photo right here right that here this guy is he is um uh he's starting something <laughs> right but it's it's going to come back <laughs> to him. Um, it, it's it, he's starting something and he thinks it's not his problem, but we can see that very shortly it is going to be his problem. That that these toxic patterns have a way of sticking around, right? They don't just go away, right? That that every action has an equal and opposite reaction, but things have a way of of coming back to us. And um, what's happening in, 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 in Jacob's life is now Jacob is a, in this part of the story that we're gonna look at today, Jason, Jacob is now a mature man. He's an, he's an older man and he is, he has children of his own. Um, he he has these 
a 12 sons, right? He, you know, um, he, he's got these sons and um, they have, Joseph and his brothers have kind of taken on the, the, the persona and the personality and the same patterns of their mothers. So their mothers have become, you know, remember, you, you remember the story that Jacob was cheated by his uncle Laban and Laban tricked him and gave him the older daughter first, um, Leah, and he wanted Rachel. So he ended up working uh, seven additional years to get the woman that he really loved. Well, both of those wives came or daughters were given to him with their own handmaids. And so they became wives to, to Jacob. And that's an interesting story in and of itself. Um, but because of the dynamics, they had become combative and, 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 and perpetuating conflict amongst each other. And they themselves start to take on this schemer, you know, because these are Laban's kids. They are schemers, right? Laban's a schemer. So they are schemers, right? So now his, the, the children now are taking on, they got kind of this scheme gene from their mom and their dad, right? And so they've kind of taken on the combativeness of their mothers, their parents. And um, Jacob, is kind of like in the middle of it, but the his children, the sons, are all equally as combative and possibly even more combative than their parents, than their mothers. And so Joseph is the the oldest son of uh, the 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 prize wife, um, Rachel, and and so he is favored by his father. And um, as a result, he is kind of singled out because um, his father, you know, makes him a same coat of many colors and he, he gives him this like special treatment. And so it causes his brothers to hate him more. But then, um, you know, he has these dreams and he's telling them his dreams and you know, the, he just, he's just not a very likable guy. He's a spoiled brat and, you know, probably a bit of a know-it-all. And, you know, he, he appears, when you read the text closely, he appears to not get it, that he, he's annoying and he's, you know, uh, self-absorbed. So his brothers really hate him. And so what, if you look closely at the story, you're able to see how this is just the continue. Remember Rebecca, remember Jacob's, um, um, Jacob's mom, how she taught him. You're able to see that these guys got from grandma and from, or not from grandma, from, um, well, yeah, they, these, are, these are Jacob's kids. So they, they got from um, grandma that they are, they are schemers, but then they also got from their granddad on their on their mother's side this scheme gene as well, right? So, so these guys, when you look closely, you'll see that they they're kind of conniving themselves, right? And we can see how these patterns just kind of persist, right? I hope you follow me. But let's go to to um, chapter thirty seven, Genesis chapter thirty seven, and I'm gonna. I'm going to start reading with verse 12 here. It says, now Joseph and his brothers had, now his brothers had gone to graze his father's flock at Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, as you know, your brothers are grazing Your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I am going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, 
go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks with the flocks and bring them bring word back to me then he sent him off from the valley of hebron where joseph arrived in shechem a man found him wandering around in the field and asked him what are you looking for He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? They moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But when they saw him, but they saw him in, a, in the distance and before he reached him, they plotted to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. And then we'll see what comes of his dream. So you, you got to notice how profound this moment is, right? That they they are scheming to kill their brother. So there it is. They're, they're these conniving and scheming plans, right? They're going to... They decided and they're plotting to kill him. And then they have already thought of a lie to tell, to tell their, to tell their parents. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Um, throw him into the cistern here in the wilderness don't lay a hand on him reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father so when joseph came to his brothers they stripped him of his robe the ornate robe he was wearing and they took him and threw him into the cistern the cistern was empty and there was no water in it and as they sat down to meal they look up and saw a caravan of ishmaelites coming from gilead the camels were loaded with spices balm and myrrh and they were on their way to take them down to egypt judah said to his brothers what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood come let us sell him to the ishmaelites and not lay hands on him, not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. So <laughs> this, this story always really, really gets me, right? And it's this part in particular that gets me, that his brothers are scheming. They, they have this conniving plan that they're going to that they're going to kill their brother Joseph. And they said, um, here comes a dreamer. Let's kill him. And then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. But, but then as they have thrown him in the cistern, Judah has this bright idea that let's not just kill him. Because if we kill him, what, what good is that to us? That we don't get a benefit if he just dies, right? Um, and it really does show, and I, I got a I got a book coming out in 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 this this fall, and I, I deal with this story deeply in my book. Um, but it really shows, I, I don't think we talk about this little piece enough that it really shows exactly how conniving Judah is. Judah's probably like the worst of the brothers, the most conniving because he wants to benefit from his brother's demise. He doesn't want to just end him. He wants to end him and get paid, right? So it really speaks to how sinister Judah is. But Judah says, let's, let's sell him. And, and when, I, when I think about this, 
you know, I, I think about, you know, we, we, we saw that picture um, before, right, of, of the man with the, um, with, with, the, with the stones, right? He's pushing those stones. And, and he thinks that that's the end of it. Um, but it is not, right? And what we find out is that, you know, some people in this day and time, they call it karma. Um, I, I don't necessarily call it karma. Um, I call it the law of the universe, right? That God has, God has set the universe to operate this way, right? That you, whatever you do is coming back to you, right? And so uh, we, we, we talked about how, how, how you break those patterns, right? But this is one way they persist. They persist because you got it, whether you, what, wait, whether you got it by, by, by nature or by, by nurture, um however you got it you know you you got it it is what it is and and it is going to continue this way it's going to persist unless you embrace the struggle and embrace the supernatural influence of god right but but otherwise you're going to be stuck in this cycle of 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 toxicity and brokenness and hurt and pain, and and this is how it continues, right? Ah, here comes that dreamer. Let's throw him in a pit, and we'll see what becomes of his dreams. And then, and then Judah takes it a step farther, and he says, "Wait a minute, guys. Let's not let's not just throw him in a pit. Let's not just kill him, because if we kill him, what benefit is there to us?" But here's what we find out. You know, you you wonder how these how these patterns persist. Well, one of the ways is that um, the fact is, what goes around comes around, right? And 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 listen, I'm going to share something with you that again, I don't think we talk about this enough. That um, there's an interesting little story that's juxtaposed within this story. And it seems dis, dis misplaced and disjointed. It seems like it's like it's out of place, but no, 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 no. It is there because God intends that these folks are gonna learn their lesson and we're gonna break this cycle. But remember what goes around comes around. So let's look at it. It's Genesis chapter 38 and I'm gonna begin uh, with verse, uh, with chapter one, it, well, I said chapter one, I'm in verse one, but it's important to, I'll, I'll, well, I'll start from the beginning and then you can kind of get the, the sense here, right? What goes around coming around. And I remember Judah was the one that said, uh, let's not just kill him, let's sell him, right? So that we can get a benefit. So he is conniving so that in a way that his father is going to have to grieve the loss of his son. So at that time, Judah left his brothers and went down to stay with a man in Adullam named Hira. And there Judah met the daughter of a Canaanite man named Shua. He married her and made love to her. And she became pregnant and gave birth to a son who's, who was named Ur. She conceived again and gave birth to a son and named him Onan. She gave birth still to another son and named him Shelah. It was at Kizib that she gave birth to him. Judah got a wife for, his fir for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But, Ur's, but Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the Lord's sight. So the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, sleep with your brother's wife and for, fulfill, fulfill your duty to her 
as a brother-in-law to raise up offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that the child would not be his. So whenever he slept with his brother's wife, he spilled his semen on the ground to keep from providing offspring for his brother. What he did was wicked in the Lord's sight. So the Lord put him to death also. Judah then said to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, live as a widow in your father's household until my son Shelah grows up. For he thought he may die too, just like his brothers. So Tamar went to live in her father's household. After a long time, Judah's wife, the daughter of Shua died. And when Judah had recovered from his grief, he went up to Timnah to the men who were shearing his sheep and his friend Hira, the Adulamite went with him. When Tamar was told your father-in-law is going on his way to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's clothes and covered him herself with a veil to disguise herself and then sat down at the entrance of Enam, Enaim, which is on the road to Timnah, for she saw that through Shela, for she saw that though Shela had not now grown up, she had not been given to him as a wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute for she had covered her face. Not realizing that she was his daughter-in-law, he went over to her by the roadside and said, come now, let me sleep with you. And what will you give me to sleep with you? She asked. I'll send you a goat from my flock, he said. Will you give me something as a pledge until you send it, she asked. And he said, what pledge should I give you? Your seal and your cord and the staff in your hand, she answered. So she gave them to her and slept with her and she became pregnant by him. Now, I'm gonna just stop right there because the story is really deep. Basically what happens is, and maybe I should just challenge you to read the rest of the story, but basically what happens is, um, she, as you saw, she got pregnant and when she had the baby, now, this is his daughter-in-law who had veiled herself, right? Uh, when she had the baby, she was being accused of being an adulteress, uh, being a prostitute, being a being a loose woman, and now she's going to be she's going to be the she's going to be cursed and she's going to be possibly stoned and so on and so forth. Um, but she sends a message to him secretly, basically that. Um, is his baby. And so he is doubly shamed because number one, she wouldn't be and he wouldn't be in this predicament had he kept his word. Um, and number two, um, um, he wouldn't have been um, in the situation had he not been doing some shady background activity, you know, he, you know, he's kind of slipping and tipping in the shadows. And now he's been kind of found out. So there, there's a powerful message at the end, where he realizes um, that, you know, it's, it's his baby, where he says that she is more righteous than I. And so the story seems um, ill positioned, or poorly, um, poorly, you know, situated, but it's, I believe it's actually strategic in that um, God is, is showing us this whole concept of the law of the universe. Scripture says, be not deceived, God is not mocked, whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. And so he has sowed these seeds of deception and conniving and scheming and has even perpetuated it in his family. Um, that he has not kept his word to his daughter-in-law, but the end result for him is pain in that he has lost his sons and, and not that, not specifically that he lost his sons as a result of his conniving, right? But be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. He caused pain in that he took his father's son from him. And so God took two sons from him, you see? And so he is 
living a life of suffering and pain. Remember, one of the ways that God roots out toxic patterns is through struggle. And he has this hardship uh, because God is teaching him um, uh, uh, that, that the solution is not scheming. The solution is heartfelt devotion and care and consideration. And what happens is that later on, we get to see that even though he was the one with the sinister plan and the sinister idea to, to sell his brother, he ends up becoming the one who is more the, kind of the most devout. And he, instead of trying to benefit from pain, he places himself on the line in his own his own life on the line when there is a crisis in the family. So you really get to see how 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 Jacob's son Judah learns to to break those cycles because of his own struggles and because of his own pain and 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 really uh, supernatural influence in his in his life as well. Um, I, I just, I'm going to talk about this more in the next session, but it, it reminds us the story of Judah and this story of, you know, Jacob's whole family and life is that, you know, whatever you put down into the ground, it's coming back and whatever seed you plant, it's coming back a hundredfold. You know, when you plant one orange seed, you get a whole orange tree. And so it, it, it's important for us to remember when we talk about breaking toxic patterns that uh, whatever we put out into the world, we're going to get back more of it. Whatever seed we plant, we're going to get it a hundredfold. And so if we want to continue those uh, patterns of brokenness, uh, then we perpetuate them with more brokenness and toxicity. But if we want to break those patterns, we got to plant new seeds and we got to we got to begin taking the steps towards towards healing. Listen, I'm glad you hung out with me and um, I want you to keep to stay tuned. Um, you can go to the website thinkingright.com and click on the tab Real Talk Tuesday and look at any of the past study sessions. Uh, be sure to use the hashtag RTT study um, to share this and to to encourage people to, to tune in. And then you can uh, shoot me your questions at CC Think and Write on social media. And, and I'll be sure to answer your questions uh, at the best, the best of my ability. All right. Why don't we pray? God, we thank you for your goodness and your grace and for um, just a reminder that uh, you always, you always bring uh, to fruition whatever we uh, establish in the world you always multiply. It's always multiplied to us and, and, and returned to us. So God, we pray that you help us to plant good seeds and so that we would reap a blessed harvest. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I will see you next time on the next session of Real Talk Tuesday.